Thanks very much for joining us uh, this afternoon as we welcome the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Norway to Columbia University and our World Leaders Forum. I'd like to begin by recognizing our co-sponsor for this talk, that's Columbia's Center on Global Economic Governance. I'd also like to thank our moderator, Wilmot James, who is the Senior Research Scholar in the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, and who is interim chair of the Center for Pandemic Research. Wilmot has been a great asset to this institution, leading great dis public discussions on global challenges during the pandemic. He is also involved in or leading a number of important COVID initiatives, including a comparative study of how Egypt, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa have responded to COVID-19, and the program in vaccine education led by Columbia's Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons. It goes without saying that it's been a very different World Leaders Forum for us this fall. Typically, heads of state and government gather in New York for the meeting of the UN General Assembly, and we're fortunate to welcome many of them to our campus to discuss issues of the moment and to answer questions from our students. This year, we've had to adapt and host our events virtually, but the results have been very gratifying nonetheless. Last week, we hosted the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, for his inaugural State of the Planet Address. And Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the Prime Minister of Greece, for a conversation about the past, present, and future of his country took place last week. Our guest this afternoon is Norway's Prime Minister, Ernest Solberg. She has been the leader of the Conservative Party of Norway since 2004 and was elected to her current post in 2013. She won re-election four years later. Since 2016, the Prime Minister has co-chaired the UN Secretary General's Advocacy Group for the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2021, her nation will begin a two-term a two-year term on the UN Security Council, focusing on peace diplomacy, the inclusion of women, the protection of civilians, and climate change and security. Throughout the past year, Norway has received widespread praise for its swift and effective response to COVID-19. It has spared the country the worst effects of the global pandemic. In the spring, the Prime Minister and her government instituted a targeted but brief lockdown. They promoted clear health and safety guide guidelines, offered widespread testing, and implemented strict border and quarantine restrictions. They paired these measures with financial assistance for unemployed and struggling citizens, including support for women and families. They took care of their frontline workers and prioritized access to education for school children. And they did all this with compassion and competence, even going so far as to host several televised news conferences for children where they answered questions from their youngest constituents. The end result is that the government's policies have enjoyed widespread support among citizens and compliance remains high. Indeed, while many nations in Europe were forced to reimpose lockdowns this fall, Norway has kept its economy and society open with policies that allow life to continue on. Looking ahead, the Prime Minister also invested heavily in the development of COVID-19 vaccines, both domestically and globally. As co-chair of the World Health Organization-sponsored initiative that launched in the spring, access to COVID-19 tools at Accelerator, she has taken a lead role in fast-tracking international development and distribution of vaccines and therapeutics, with a special focus on getting them to countries that are not wealthy. The Prime Minister joins us this afternoon to discuss all this 
and much more. Please join me in welcoming our guest and our moderator. Thank you very much. Welcome, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, Lee Bollinger, for that um, lovely introduction and fulsome uh, introduction to Prime Minister uh, Salberg. Um, I would just add um, from my end, uh, by way of introduction, that I see you've been leading coalition governments, uh, which, as you know, are very, very tricky uh, to do, and you've done it with great success. I also just wanted to highlight the fact that um, that you serve as a co-chair uh, with my own country, South Africa's uh, President, Sir Ramaphosa, uh, the ACT uh, Acceleration Facilitation Council. Uh, President Lee Bollinger um, has mentioned the fact that you will lead Norway uh, as an upcoming new member of the UN Security Council, and that you have been uh, in this work for a long time uh, and established the UN COVID-19 Response Recovery Fund. So those are acts of great leadership, and we want to say to you that we admire that greatly. What we like to um, uh, tackle today um, is the whole question of funding and developing uh, new and smart partnerships for global health security systems uh, to deal with uh, epidemic and pandemic crisis preparedness, um, especially since we're sitting in the middle of one presently COVID-19. And so I just wanted to start off by uh, posing the following question to you. Um, that goes as follows, that we have seen, as you know, the ascendance recently of a very reactive nationalism in the world, a kind of resurge in unilateralism uh, and an isolationism. And in the case of the outgo outgoing United States administration, a kind of contempt for multilateral agreements mm. and a contempt for what has been a very powerful history of global common purpose in tackling global challenges. Uh, like climate change, like health security, and most immediately um, uh, responding to COVID-19 uh, and securing vaccines uh, for those who need it. And I was going to ask you whether you would share your vision for how we reestablish a, a kind of reinvigorated multilateralism, one with new energy, one with new a new sense of common purpose. Um, as you intend to occupy your place in the UN Security Council and clearly will lead on this question. I mean, what are your priorities as you see it? How do you intend to be, bring this divided world together to fight global issues as one, um, united with a common purpose? Well, it's a very big question you are asking, of course. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, there is a reason, of course, why uh, uh, what I would call a small country in the world, or medium size, somebody else would say, are, are of course say always saying that it's in our interest that the multilateral organizations are functioning. We are not naive. We know that there are policies, politics, and rivalism also inside multilateral organizations, but we still believe that having a world that is ruled by law, not by force or by economy, but ruled by uh, rules and regulations done by multilateral organizations or in, when it comes to conflicts by the Security Council, um, that we have those type of organizations are extremely important for the most part of the countries in the world, because all of us who are not big countries depend on the fact that other countries are not violating our rights by using uh, economic force or using uh, a military force uh, to get their their interest uh, um, served. And I think this was all the basis of creating the United Nations after the Second World War and trying to, to get people to work together. Uh, when I say we are not naive, it's because we do understand that there are rivalism, there are conflicts, there are five uh, uh, veto countries in the Security Council that always can um, make sure that nothing happens in certain situations because they have vital interests. Uh, I, I, it's been devastating to see how Syria has developed uh, 10 years of conflict nearly now. Next year, we will get into the 10th year of, of, of conflict in, in, in Syria. And uh, without having a functioning multilateral organization, 
to to guide the way because there are two vital interests for 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 large country with the veto power in the security council but we do believe that there is a lot of things that we have to work together we live in a globalized world we live in a world where uh, trade um, technology all of this brings us much tighter together we travel more together and small viruses moves very fast in in that type of a world that means that we will we will be worse out if we do not work together instead uh, and try to solve all of these issues uh, separately and apart from each other and we have a climate that needs that we are cooperating we have oceans that need that we are cooperating so we have to work on trying to find um, rules regulations but also agendas uh, coalitions to try to uh, to make this world better and behind me i have the 17 sustainable development goals the global goals and of course they were decided because we needed a, um, a platform uh, um, a map or, or a way forward for us to try to solve this interlinkage between climate environment uh, social uh, justice issues you know on health on security but also on creating jobs development and trying to work these interconnected as a plan for the whole world. And I, uh, I still believe that this is an important work to do. And I believe that countries coming together, I think more and more are seeing now that we need, um, we need to be talking uh, face to face, trying to find ways of dealing with all of these issues. And I think with all of the targets and the 17 goals, with all the targets, it's, it's a good platform to work from. And then we need to have organizations that are functioning and uh, we have to have UN reform, but you know, not having a perfect multilateral world does not mean that you should just put it aside. You should try to, per to perfect it. You should try to make it better instead of those who are uh, reluctantly just uh, um, moving themselves away from, from the multilateral organizations. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, you raise a number of issues. Um, if I can explore the one around United Nations reform. I mean, the, the United Nations clearly has credibility if there's a, a critical mass of leading states who say that this is a forum that we should respect. It does represent the world. Um, and we've gone through a period of four years where the United Nations has come under attack uh, the World Health Organization has come under attack. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is to build a new coalition of leading states who say that multilateralism works. At the same time, the United Nations does need reform uh, and it does need to change. Uh, it is 70 years old, uh, if I count correctly. And so the question is, uh, what is that reform agenda? Do you have a view for what what kind of reform agenda you'd like to see introduced into the United Nations? Well, first of all, it has to become more representative of, of the world's population as it is today. Uh, of course, uh, the Security Council is not representative of the world the way it is today. That means that we need to we need to look at different countries' representation, also permanent representation, because they are they are these are these are the structures that we have built has been is reflecting the world as it was seen after the Second World War, and we still need to work on that. Then we need to get all of the UN family to work together. And we have done a lot of work on that from Norway's side. Uh, if I just recap a little bit on what we've done on, on international health work. Um, in, in 2014, we had the Ebola. Uh, the World Health Organization was unprepared for it. They didn't raise the flag. Uh, you had three countries with that. Uh, with, with large numbers of people dying, and you had not, not enough knowledge, not understanding, and they absolutely did not have enough health, health workers. Uh, after that, you know, work that was done to help to contain uh, Ebola at that time, we called together with Germany and Ghana for a, a, a review commission uh, for what, what went wrong with the international response on Ebola. And after that, the World Health Organization has uh, followed the recommendation, but we also managed to make sure that it's not just the World Health Organization. There's no been built a platform 
on all of the different agencies and international work, uh, the organizations that work on health to cooperate and be uh, where the World Health Organization are in lead, so that you don't have all of these competitions that goes on, who does what work and try to work on the same agenda. So I think we have moved quite along. And I think we also have to do that reform work because I see, I've worked a lot on, on education. I see competition between different agencies who want to have well, money from Norway or other donor countries, so compete in the same country. So we have to we have to streamline a little bit and and try to find a ways of making sure that there is one agenda on the issue, so that we are solving this better. And I think the World Health Organization therefore reacted much better to to um, uh, COVID-19. You can always discuss was it fast enough? Did I pronounce it as a pandemic early enough? But they worked much faster than I did with Ebola. And they have worked much faster in, and cooperated much better with all the other organizations that are around to make sure that we are, you know, tackling this pandemic in, in the right way. So I would entirely agree that uh, supporting the World Health Organization is of the greatest importance, that it is the only body with a model authority to um, to deal with issues of surveillance uh, uh, and uh, diagnostics and pandemic support, uh, support for countries. The, the key issue that's come up with COVID-19 is the slow speed of reporting coming out of China. Uh, and so that is something clearly that the WHO would have to um, pay attention to. Um, but I wanted to ask you a different question uh, um, uh, based on your comment. Uh, to do with the chairpersonship that you have with um, President Cyril Ramaphosa and the ACT Acceleration Facilitation Council. Because it is a unique collaboration to fast track the development of COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, you are a founding member uh, as the country um, in Nor as Norway supporting Gavi, uh, part of CEPI's uh, foundation and also the Global Fund. So you've been involved pushing hard for quite a long time in establishing facilities and institutions and funding uh, health security advancement from the very start. Um, my question is, how do you intend to galvanize political leadership uh, and get broad international support for the ACT Accelerator? Uh, and how would, you, how, do you, how would you see building that uh, in fora like the United Nations, the G20, the, the G7, uh, the Paris Peace uh, Forum, the IF, IMF World Bank Group meetings, uh, and through your respective regional cooperation groups and national processes. Uh, and there's one question, would you make a special effort to reach out even to those who are reluctant mm -hmm. to join this uh, international collaboration effort? Absolutely. Uh, let me start by saying it's uh, it's true. We, we've worked, and I, I think the fact that we established SEPE in uh, 2017, which was among the same countries that had worked on Ebola and seeing we will have a pandemic, we will have an ep uh, uh, epidemic and we need to have somebody who works up, you know, our possibilities to work fast on vaccines. It's been an important groundwork for what is happening now. And in fact, I started to call out to other uh, leaders in other countries uh, in, in January, February, uh, on trying to get more funding for, for vaccines at that time because we needed to fast track it. At that time, there was a little bit of reluctance, you know, thinking that this is not going to be so hard when we have all of our very organized health systems in our part of the world in Europe. But we showed we didn't manage that well in Europe. I mean, we have uh, had uh, catastrophic situations on some health facilities around Europe. and. And, and of course, the interest has increased. And, and um, one thing you do, of course, is, is that we, we've, which this has led up to is, of course, the ACT-A uh, and, and the fact that uh, we have to make sure that we are fighting this pandemic, not only in the countries that can afford to pay for tests, to pay for diagnostics and to pay for, for our vaccines, but in fact, we're also having mechanisms to make sure that countries who are not able to do that on their own hand also gets access to this. We have a crisis now that has, is 1.5 uh, million, uh, million people who have uh, died. We have, uh, I think we have a loss, which is now over $7 trillion 
in economic activity in the world. There are so many jobs, there are so many people who are unemployed. It has a catastrophic uh, economic effect. And one country, if you solve the situation in one country, it, we won't bunch back because in this integrated economy, we need all countries to participate and we need all countries to be back and to have solved this, um, the health crisis to make sure that we can solve also the economic crisis. And the reason why I'm saying this is that this is my biggest pitch for why I want more countries to uh, to deliver money for for uh, for Act A. Also, if I talk to uh, political leaders in countries that have not done it's a, it's it is a plain good macroeconomic uh, response now for countries for their own economy to participate in making sure that we are stopping the effects of the pandemic in the whole world not only in single countries and um, the, it's an easy way of we are, i would say we are trying to to send around the hats or taking the uh, collective, uh, you know, uh, collecting money in the church or sending around the hats uh, to get money, meaning that you, that besides we had this call for D20, they put this into their their um, closing remarks of, of uh, the G20 meeting, saying that, and in that way, saying that all the G20 countries should commit to, to Act A. And now uh, it was a letter that was sent by uh, by President Ramaphosa, me and the and the Commission, uh, European Commission uh, President, and we will try to start to call people and to ask them to participate, to say that they have to uh, to do. So that's why I say we're sending around the hat, or we are collecting the money. We are we are in fact doing direct response to to different uh, prime ministers and presidents to say, uh, you know, you have to to participate in this. This is an economic uh, sound thing to do for all countries of the world to stop the pandemic. So, I mean, you're, you're quite right. So um, a small investment, a relatively small investment today to beef up preparedness for future outbreaks uh, yields huge dividends in the number of lives saved, uh, the number of people who uh, don't get ill, and also in terms of economic opportunities that are in fact preserved. So the returns are extraordinary, and so investment um, matters, and uh, matters a great deal. Uh, the, the difficulty has always been that uh, prior to COVID-19, um, countries hesitated to borrow money for something that may or may not happen. And they'd rather borrow money to build houses, for example. It's entirely understandable to build schools. So the whole question of financing for preparedness has, has become a challenge. Uh, the World Bank is involved in financing um, response. Clearly, it's begun to introduce instruments for financing preparedness. But it actually uh, is a challenge uh, to get that right. Pandemic response is one thing, but preparedness investment is quite another, uh, even though the economics of that makes sense. Uh, and also the health arguments make a whole lot of sense. So uh, just to say that I uh, really admire your leadership in pushing on an issue. And I thought you yeah. might want to comment on that. Yeah. yeah, and I would just also like to say it's not only countries that should participate in this. That's why we are asking both philanthropists but also large corporations to participate in financing this. Um, they are, uh, some of them are gaining from the situation we have now some of them are losing they are, but they all will in the future lose more if the economic downturn goes the downward spiral instead of going upwards so they should also participate in this uh, but it's difficult to get uh, people to pay for things that crisis that hasn't occurred uh, doesn't give election benefits either I mean, um, I usually say as a joke that we politicians, we really are looking for the trouble because if there is no trouble, why why should people vote and why should they vote on us? So maybe sometimes we uh, we create larger problems than uh, or at least verbally uh, talk up problems instead of uh, uh, doing the easy solutions to them. And I think uh, and, and if you really want my, you know, the view of what happened on a lot of the rhetorics this last year, it's also been about, you know, creating problems where there are no problems because the other problems are too big to handle. And uh, and um, uh, so there's a, there's a, there's absolutely a need. Um, uh, we need more long-term thinking in politics these days. 
I think I, I believe in democracies on all scales as better systems than non-democratic uh, societies, but we are a little bit, uh, but we are not good enough on long-term thinking. And we should even be better on that because, the, you know, this uh, um, next election period is coming closer up for everybody and you, you, you are looking more for what will give you voter support the next election instead of solving the large problem. And then the problems will become so big that you will lose the election. And that's what I usually say. If, if, you, if there are some fundamental big problems, you can end up losing an election because you have neglected them instead of solving them. And there is one health issue that I think we are not prepared for which I have called in the UN earlier on for more action on, and that's uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance, because I think this is the biggest, will be the biggest backward step for health in the world if we are not dealing with that better than we are do doing today. And I know we have all the knowledge about this. We have, we, we have to work on uh, to make sure that we are still having functional antibiotics in the world, but there is not done enough research. We are overusing. Countries are not putting in policies of restricting the use of, uh, or, of antibiotics in a way that they should do, and you will get less functioning antibiotics. And it's a very good example on, on an issue that I think everybody now knows is the biggest next health risk we have, and too little is done about it. So you're, you're quite right. So the, some of the gaps uh, have to do with um, unregulated uh, use of um, antibiotics in agriculture and in, uh, as well as in the, both on the plant side and as, as well as on the livestock side. Uh, and so that's where the gap lies. Uh, well, part of the gap around antimicrobial resistance. Um, could you share with us what Norway does on that front in terms of um, uh, well, how have... it deals with... And we... We've been working, uh, there's very strict regulations on using that in livestock. So, in fact, I think we now have, together with Sweden, the lowest number of use of antibiotics in, in livestock. In fish farming, for example, stopped using our antibiotics 25 years ago. They are vaccinating all the salmon we are producing in this country. So, there's a vaccination scheme for this thing since then, because, because, uh, uh, um, because that has been important, you know, for having healthy fish. So we are trying to work on that instead using using other other. We have had, uh, and we are working now much more on lowering uh, the use for humans. Also, I mean, we live in a cold country. People get colds, and they are. So we try to get uh, less use of that by their by by doctors and. And, and we see that that number has fallen quite rapidly also in the last years. So it's possible because there is a, um, a feeling and there is a restriction. And then we are supporting uh, research and development of uh, new, anti uh, new antibiotics to make sure that there are also developed new ones because we will need them for some people. We will need them and we need to have antibiotics that there has not been created resistance against already. But there's, there's this economic dilemma, you know, we want to have the antibiotics, but we don't want to use them too much. That means that there's little, little incentive for the pharmaceutical industry to produce new strains of antibiotics because they, uh, we will say that they should not push it. And, and if you can't push your medicine, then you will not uh, maybe have a priority on producing it either. So we believe that we need to have more public um, uh, financing for that and more restricted use. So now you're absolutely right. And I think that um, um, sort of international best practices uh, is exemplified by what Norway is, how, how, it's, how it's approaching the, approaching the issue with a range of other countries. And so the high risk areas are in uh, are to some degree domestic, but they're rather global. So um, I just wanted to return to the issue of um, uh, the effect COVID-19 has had as a um, uh, on, the, on the economies. Um, and if we look at the continent of Africa, uh, what we expect is a contraction between 4% uh, to 5%. Uh, in 2020, and it will spark probably the first recession on the continent for 25 years. 
and it will reduce per capita income to about what we've seen in 2010. So it's a massive contraction. Uh, and some African countries are better prepared to recover than others. Um, Ethiopia is will continue a fairly good growth path and so on. Uh, so there's, there's uh, South Africa will struggle and so will Nigeria in terms of growing. So there's a question of persistence and aid uh, to African countries, but it really in the end is to get the economies growing again. And that means increased trade, that means the tourists must come back, uh, which means the conditions have to be right for that. Uh, and there has a, a need for investment in, especially in small business, businesses that the, the value chain in the leisure business and so on. Um, how do you see sort of a, a what is your vision for a, a rebooting, restarting of economies in the developing South, not just uh, just not just uh, Africa itself, uh, to get the economic growth going? Because that, in the end, is what's required to generate the resources mm -hmm. for better pandemic preparedness in the future. Well, I think the biggest, I think we have to be honest that in a lot of developing countries, uh, especially Africa, some of the Asian countries, they have been harder hit by the economic recession than by COVID-19. They have been more, the economic, I mean, a lot of countries closed down before they had nearly the first cases uh, in their own country and have been very struck by that. I, I spoke to a lot of African leaders during the spring and they were talking about uh, uh, seeds not coming in so that they couldn't, you know, landlocked countries that didn't get food supply and, and you know, next year seeds to, to, for the production. Um, because, um, because uh, the harbor in the neighbor country was closed. So they didn't get uh, their, their supplies in. And things, things like that, we have disrupted all of these um, um, uh, normal uh, trade and uh, economic activity with a severe effect. Uh, the first thing we have to do is, of course, uh, uh, make sure that it's possible to have an open country, a world again, and then to increase, uh, then of course, it's uh, to fight the pandemic. That's why we are also so concerned about getting the financing and the, for the vaccines and, and, and the systems uh, functioning uh, for the whole world, not just for, for rich countries. But the second thing we, all, of course, have to do is, uh, is to look even more at how important investments are compared to development aid. Uh, there is a challenge in some countries, of course, that you don't get investment because there is a corruption problem. There is a slowness in in the administration activity in in you know making decisions on 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 uh, um, on activity because uh, uh, there's also somebody who would like to tap into. Uh, the investments uh, in a in proper way, and I think we have to be honest to talk about these issues too. That corruption leads to less efficient economies, and it also leads to more skepticism on investment. Um, and then there is a big resource possibility inside African and other countries if you stop the outflow of capital. Uh, and the outflow of capital is still uh, bigger in a lot of African countries than the inflow they have. And that means that there has to be more transparency. There has to be there has to be taxation systems, in fact, also in poor countries. If you look at Ghana, one of the things they have done the last years is, of course, being less dependent on, 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 um, on aid, more resource mobilization in their own country, meaning that they have a tax system that is functioning better, but also that they get more investments because because of, of uh, um, uh, that there are more openness in, in, in their economy for it. But I think it's important that we also are funding up the banks to make sure that they can, we can build back, bet, uh, back better. We have made this fund that is under the, the um, uh, Secretary General in the, in, in the UN to make sure that you, we can also help on the uh, economic uh, challenges that are um, are in, uh, increased by the pandemic um, to make sure that we are not just looking at the health issue, but also on other parts of the uh, of of the economy. But this is not a new issue. This has been an issue for a long time. And one of the few things, one of the things the African Union has done, of course, is to create more of an open economic area in Africa. I think that is going to be boost also the economics between the countries in Africa. There's a huge population that will demand goods and services, and it should not be supplied by 
Amazon or supplied by uh, by uh, international companies. It should also be much more supplied by neighboring countries, local businesses. Thank you very much. I agree that uh, corruption is theft, uh, and that um, that's intolerable. And what it takes is bold leadership to put a stop to it. Uh, and clearly, there has to be instruments that make it uh, possible to exact that kind of accountability and transparency and, and, and get leaders mobilized to actually act against it. So entirely right point. So Prime Minister, we wanted to give an opportunity to students to ask questions. And so I turn uh, over to the people who control uh, uh, the system uh, for the student uh, contributions to come in. Hi, Prime Minister. Uh, it's an honor of being here. My name is Jorge Marquez Gaspar. I'm a uh, master in public administration student from Venezuela. And my question is on the line of financing and also corruption. What mechanisms have you implemented to use responsibly your, for your sovereign wealth fund and resist the temptation of spending and also shield it from populist politics? And what would you recommend to countries with massive natural resources like Venezuela? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a sorry story that the, the country with the biggest natural resources in the world is uh, not managing their resources better than it's done today. In fact, uh, losing money instead of earning money on, on oil and gas. That's a, that's a sad story. Um, I think what we have done in Norway is that we have had um, we've, we've created this sovereign fund. So we, we used to have um, the oil income into our budget. It's now going directly into the surpluses, going into the into the fund. Uh, we are uh, uh, together and, and now, in fact, the income of the sovereign fund of no in Norway is larger from our investments than it is from our oil and gas sector. So the increase the last years has come more from from uh, uh, our investments outside Norway than uh, than um, uh, from from just what we have deposited from the oil and gas activity. And uh, and what we have done also is we, have, we used to say that we should save all of this money for future generation. Then uh, the sovereign fund became large. And of course, it was a it did uh, take a large part of our economic sector in Norway. So it was natural that we were using a little bit. So we have a sort of a estimated 3% uh, ben uh, or, or surplus from uh, or profit from the fund that we have said as a, as a maximum um, thing that we can take out of the sovereign fund into our budget. Um, that's a uh, amounts for I think now 12 percent or something of our budget so it's quite big but it's um, it's we also have said that it when we did this decision 20 years ago nearly uh, we also said that it should be used for growth increasing projects so that it should be a bridge towards uh, a more economic activity in other areas I will not say that we are perfectly good on that to be honest, I say we would use maybe 40% on growth increasement and 60% on on uh, uh, things that is uh, on on expenditure these days. Uh, but um, uh, we are still concentrating on trying to build roads, research, development, uh, making sure that our educational system is is functioning well. And of course, we have lower taxes for businesses, especially to be more competitive with the basis of using money from the sovereign fund. And there is a quite large, um, the, the, the broad part of the political parties agree on this. So we also say that, of course, when there's a crisis like this year, this year we will use more than 3%, but then we have to use less. So in 2019, I think we used 2.6%. So it's not that bad if we are using 3.4% this year, but you should on average be below 3%. As a, as a guiding rule. And as long as you manage to, to um, uh, uh, have this as a political standard, it's not, it's not a law, it's not forbidden to do something else, but it's become a sort of a responsible political uh, level to, you know, to take care of the next generations too. 
Uh, so thank you for that, uh, Prime Minister. If I can invite the next uh, question. Um, hello, Prime Minister. My name is Hao, and I'm with the School of International and Public Affairs. My question is, throughout the pandemic, we can see that health, like masks, can be politicized. Have you ever encountered that a policy that you care very much, but it's very difficult to convince the public to be with you, especially when nationalism has been rising in Europe. Thank you. Um, um, I'm not sure if there are any real big policy issues in Norway that have been politicized so much as this. Norway is still a country where we are happily that we have people who believe in their politicians, in their institutions. In fact, during the pandemic, we've seen uh, much higher scores also in support, you know, for the institutions. Um, and, uh, and that trust, I think, has been a very important part of the effectiveness of our measures against the pandemic, because we have not need to, you know, put people inside their flats and saying you can only go out for one hour. We have said we recommend you to work from home. Uh, we ask people not to use the commuter trains. We ask them to go out, have fresh air, but not be too close to other people. And of course, Norway is a spacious country. We are not that few. We are not that many people. So it's it's not an Asian country where you are quite crowded on the on the on the street. Uh, we have room for we have space for each other. So it's uh, that has functioned. And I think that's a that's a good um, uh, it's a good uh, good aspect of Norway. If I, the most political difficult thing Norway have had, I think, is our two discussions of becoming members of the European Union in 1972 and 1994. That was division, um, conspiracy, a lot of other things. But uh, we amended that afterwards, and uh, and and basically, we we seem to. I, I would say, like 90% of the Norwegian people are uh, are basically trusting the politicians, even if they are voting on different uh, uh, political uh, parties. But also we see in social media that there are uh, groups that are following conspiracy thinking from other countries that are saying that the pandemic, pandemic is a hoax, people are not dying, we, we get them, but you know, they are quite few. And they, they might have very active Twitter accounts, but they are quite few. So the Prime Minister is uh, actually being quite modest um, uh, in the sense that it is true that the Norwegian citizens have great faith in their governments because that government is an honest one and it delivers its services, keeps its word. But it also takes leadership to do this. Uh, and you lead a coalition government. It's, I know as a politician, that's very hard to keep together. And so the common purpose of Norway partly uh, depends in great and in great measure depends on, on your own leadership. So, um, so I think you're being a bit modest. I think that uh, that's, uh, that's really a great example to the world. If I can invite the next uh, question from the student. Uh, hello, thank you, Madam Prime Minister. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name's Ayub and I'm a first year student here at the college. And my question is that over the last four years, we've seen a weakening of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, how do you see that relationship changing in the future and how will that change affect our ability to collaborate on global issues? Well, I, I think we have uh, on some issues like security issues. I don't think the transatlantic bond has been 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 um, uh, lowered. I think uh, even though Trump sometimes um, states a lot of things about about uh, NATO and others, but they, they he still is uh, they still is followed up on 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 uh, the security issues. What I do believe a new administration will bring to the floor is, of course, um, on the more multilateral global issues where I think a lot of European countries are thinking it's important that we do work together. Climate change, for example, uh, Paris Agreement, uh, the World Health Organization, as we've said earlier on, those those organizations, we really need them to function to make sure that that this is um, 
uh, that we are solving the most uh, difficult issues in the world. And that's where I think we've had the biggest challenge between the in the last four years is that when the U.S. administration is we, uh, uh, going out of these international agreements, organizations, um, we will not. We, we should have even more force to work together, and I hope that that will become better. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Can I invite the next um, question? Hello, Prime Minister. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Grace Fitzgerald Diaz. I'm a first year in Columbia College. Um, uh, and I was wondering, so oil is a significant uh, um, portion of Norway's economy, and I was wondering how the country plans to shift that in order to meet its sustainability goals and what the timeline for that is. Well, we have, uh, it's true that oil and ga uh, natural gas is a uh, part, big part of our economy. It's been uh, it's been like that, um, especially the last 30 years, where a lot of our growth have come from high oil and gas prices. We do have some strong other industries at the same time, so we are not, I think we are more in a better position than a lot of other oil and gas producing countries because we have a large maritime and marine um, uh, industry beside that. Uh, and we, of course, have uh, metal, metal, uh, and and uh, and 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 quite a lot of other types of industries. But it is a challenge, and one of the things that we are doing now is, of course, trying to make both our current activity greener. For example, the fact that we are now trying to combine uh, production, the production facilities we have for oil and gas, to make sure that they are zero emitters in the production part. That's what we are. We should do according to the Paris Agreement. Is that we should not have emissions from the production during the uh, during the production part. The demand side you have to do with other policies, but we are undermining demand for oil and gas by hugely have, by having sponsored and uh, the, uh, the the large movement towards electrical cars. In fact. Uh, more than 50% of the new cars sold in Norway are electrical cars because we're giving big benefits to oh, lower taxation on cars uh, with zero emissions. So, so it becomes uh, a large price incentive for people to buy that. Then we are working on on the, the future where we will have less oil and gas in Norway. We have we have peaked in our production. We are steadily moving downwards on on the production levels from from Norway, and and um, uh, what we are trying to do now is to use our knowledge of of um, uh, uh, of uh, offshore um, uh, drilling and uh, oil and gas activity towards floating wind, which is, uh, I think, a very strong wind power based on the floating, not not um, uh, not in shallow waters, which we think is a big possibility for the future for a lot of countries to make sure that they can get energy from that, is to uh, make uh, blue hydrogen out of, uh, of um, the natural gas we have so that you can, uh, can store the CO2. Uh, and we are, have a large project of, of uh, CCS, carbon capture and storage, because uh, we have now shown for more than 14 years it's possible to store CO2 in the seabed again to bring it back. If you can do that, we, for example, have that large scheme we just passed in Parliament that we will support um, um, uh, a concrete uh, production plant um, uh, in Norway to collect its uh, to, to capture its CO2, and then we will have to distribute it back, and then we will uh, will take it into the ground again, and and that's important because the uh, concrete sector there, which is a, the building material we all need, that stands for nearly seven percent of the world emissions. So if we can manage to capture the the CO2 from that production, uh, it will be um, uh, a significant step forward for the whole world. So we are looking at other ways of using our natural resources than using it directly for energy. So thank you very much for that uh, answer and response, uh, Prime Minister. If I can invite the next student question. Hello, um, dear Ms. Salzberg, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's an honor. really appreciate this unique opportunity to be speaking to you. Um, my name is Julia Pontes. I'm a Brazilian graduate student here at Columbia. I'm also a Planetary Health Alliance ambassador. 
and I work documenting and researching uh, mining industries, social and environmental impacts, especially focused in my home country and in Latin America. And you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that Norway is a small country. However, it's been playing a leading role in the discussion of sustainability. And as a Brazilian, I truly uh, appreciate the contribution that Norway was doing with the sovereign fund and funding the Amazon fund and the recent position considering uh, um, the, you know, uh, suspending the funding, uh, considering Bolsonaro's uh, deregula deregulation of environmental uh, rules. However, my question is in 2018, a highly toxic spill of aluminum plant uh, owned by Hydro in Pará and the northern Brazil and the part of the Amazon biome revealed illegal pipes that polluted and contaminated uh, close by river and the soil with lead, arsenic and mercury and Nork Hydro is controlled by Norwegian capital and by then a third of it was controlled by, by the Norwegian government. And up until today, activists and popular leaders are facing threats for their fights against uh, hydro impacts. And my question is that I, I understand that we are living in a complex reality. However, how does the Norwegian government plan to address accountability for social and environmental impacts of Norwegian investments, private and public? Um, and especially considering when those infractions happen in countries with newer or challenged democracies and higher corruption levels. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Well, we are demanding from all of our companies that they do hold uh, a high standard on their, uh, on their impact when they are in their international um, investments. And they have to they also report on this, and I think Noskiru is reporting a lot on this. I think they have taken this action very seriously. It's been a lot of reported in Norway too, to try to find out what have gone wrong, um, what's the truth in all of these, and and to try to find uh, ways of making sure that this doesn't, uh, uh, how how big of these effects are on on both local community and others and i think i think they are really concerned about this uh, this issue and they are they also know that this is part of their their um, their trademark will be ruined if they are not uh, if they're not responsible in the way that they are they are working um of course this is a this is a company that they bought up i think some years back uh, it used to be an uh, another company so they are, I think, going through all of these uh, activities that have been done to make sure that this is uh, done properly in the future. I think most of the, the large corporations like this, they are reporting on, uh, on the standards that they have to follow also on their impact on the environmental uh, uh, and health aspects of their activity. But, so um, my feeling is that at least uh, that they have been done a lot of work to try to find out what went wrong, what's the problem, and, and try to solve it. So thank you very much for that response, uh, uh, Prime Minister. I wanted to return to uh, President Lee Bollinger's comment earlier where he uh, offered uh, help from Columbia University uh, and partnerships from Columbia University. And I just wanted to say since um, both in Norway and in the case of Colombia, we have universities who are working on these problems around sustainable development, around pandemic response, uh, and a whole range of other research activities that could really help us better understand the issues, but also advance the cause of a better world. Uh, and, um, and so if there's any opportunities for collaboration around research projects uh, of mutual benefit is something we would certainly welcome uh, as something uh, to explore. Um, there is, I'm going to ask one more student, uh, give one more student an opportunity to pose a question to the Prime Minister before we then close. Uh, so if I can invite uh, the next student. Hi, Madam Prime Minister, and thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor and pleasure to have you. Um, a brief introduction. My name is Mohammed Salhout. I am the son of Palestinian immigrants originally from Jerusalem, and most of my family is still there. I'm a graduate student at Columbia University at both Columbia Business School and Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, my question is, Norway is often categorized um, in economic literature and studies as one of the most inclusive economies in the world. And I wonder what advice you would give to the United States um, as it grapples and continues to grapple with undercurrents of populism, 
to A, combat inequality, and B, build a more sustainable, inclusive economic fabric moving forward. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. well, it's a very big issue to answer. I think, depending on, uh, I, I think, uh, and I'm a, I'm a conservative politician. That means that I believe that things, we grow out of our own history. We come out of, you know, our conflicts and our discussions from, for, so it's not so easy to take a Scandinavian system which is based on our history and put it into a totally different country. Uh, the US has always been a country where there has been a lot of migrants coming. Um, it's been easier to be a migrant in the US than it is to be a migrant in Norway because big differences in wages makes it possible to get a job and work your way up. In Norway, we put people if, if, if your parents came as Palestinians to Norway today, I would have put them to school for two years to, if they had not, you know, to learn Norwegian and, and to, to learn our system, to learn Norwegian and, and to, to maybe get into the labor market. If, the, if there were university professors, of course, they wouldn't need to do it, but we have a different labor market. I mean, you cannot have a U.S. doing that. With, your, with, with the influx of people coming. That's why I usually say, yeah, and, and remember we are 5 million, 5.4 million people. We are, uh, we are um, very smaller and it's more coherent, uh, even though we are changing. Uh, but I believe there's a couple of things that is important. It's important to make sure that you have, uh, that you make sure that the benefits of development is reaching all of the people. That means that uh, seeing how you make sure that capital doesn't, uh, that both labor and capital earn from the income that the companies are doing is important. I think uh, Norway still has had a quite, even we have slightly increasing uh, inequality in Norway. It's been like that the last 20 years. It's because, and you, and you will get that if you have a growing economy with businesses that are, some people get rich because they are creative, they are doing new things and they are investing and have money. But what we also have done is to make sure that most people are following a pattern that they also feel that their world is developing, that they are getting a little bit more uh, wages every year, that there is an economic development for that. And of course, Norway has free healthcare and we have free education. Uh, you don't, um, and we even have a student loans bank that you can uh, loan money to, so that you not for your student fees, but for your for your livelihood when you're a student, uh, with a guaranteed uh, low rent in a way for that you pay back the 20 next years. It's of course a system that decreases the uh, big need for. Um, uh, it, it decreases the, uh, the inequality because some of the biggest investments you do in your life, in fact, there is a public scheme for. Is it possible in a big country like the US? I'm not sure. But of course, that's part of what we have done. I mean, we, and, and that's why uh, there have been some estimates saying that, you know, the American dream is mostly fulfilled in Norway and Sweden, meaning that, you know, you have the biggest social upward mobility. But that does not mean that we don't have problems. We have 10, 15 percent of the people who are continuously in a low income situation, who we have problems with getting into the labor market. They might get money from the government, but they are steadily in this situation. And sometimes their children inherit that situation. So there are also challenges in our society, even if they are much smaller. And we have to try, to, we are working quite a lot to try to make sure that you are not stuck in that position. Um, it's been increasing the last years because we have more refugees coming to Norway. And in the beginning, the refugees often end up in a low income situation. But if we manage to get them through and into the labor market, then it, and, and that's, that's the most important part is to make sure that there is enough jobs and that the jobs are, you can live out of the wage you get. And um, in Norway, that means that we are, there is a lot of jobs in the United States that you wouldn't see in my country because uh, it only exists because there is low wages. So we have a penetration rate of digitalization that is quite big. Um, to write a check 
is that Norwegian youth will not understand what you're talking about mm -hmm. because nobody writes checks in this country and haven't done it the last 20 years. I remember when I was a student, I had a checks, but I mean, I'm getting 60 years old next year. We all are using digital money or other ways of, so, and that's because uh, um, we become much more digitalized because wages are expensive. We become more efficient because wages are expensive, but that also leads to more need for qualification. So that's why it's difficult for a young migrant to come to Norway and uh, have his background or her background and getting into a Norwegian labor market because that's the skill demanding labor market. So there are challenges in all systems. So, uh, so Prime Minister, that brings us um, uh, to the end, um, and it's great to end on such a modern note about for uh, modern education to keep pace with modern technology uh, in this world. And so I wanted to thank you for spending an hour of your time with us. Uh, we greatly value it. Uh, we do admire your leadership. Uh, we spoke about big issues. Uh, and the most compelling one right now is to maximize access people have across the globe to the COVID-19 vaccines mm -hmm. as they appear. Uh, and you've been at the forefront of, of a whole range of initiatives to make that possible. Uh, but to keep in mind the fact that we must um, uh, return to um, the target set by the Sustainable Development Goals in order to deal with the big questions that face our planet, including climate change. So um, I just wanted to say, I see we share history, uh, academic history, in both being former sociology students, and I trust that that <laughs> has um, uh, helped you in being prime minister. Uh, but, to, um, th so, but thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, we l wish you luck, um, and uh, we will watch uh, the role that you will play. Uh, on a global stage in advancing uh, the common good and common purpose. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, much to the students uh, as well. Thank you to the audience, a very large audience that have been a part of this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye.